talk some of get. I'd like to thank the Schoberg Foundation for establishing this remarkable prize for the uh, Royal Swedish Academy for um, awarding Dennis Slayman and myself this remarkable award, um, and to all of you for attending this lecture. And I particularly want to thank our families who are here. For the past 30 years, I worked on a disease called chronic myeloid leukemia. We know that chronic myeloid leukemia is one of the four common types of leukemias representing about 15 to 20 percent of all leukemias. The incidence of this leukemia is relatively even worldwide with about one to two cases per 100,000 per year. That translates into about 100 to 200 cases per year in Sweden. In Western Europe, that's about 5,000 and also in the United States, about 5,000 new cases per year. The disease can affect any age, but typically the age of onset is between 50 to 60 years of age. Historically, if a patient was diagnosed with this leukemia, they were told that they had about three to five years to live. Throughout the last century, there have been some remarkable discoveries that have led to an understanding of the pathogenesis of this leukemia. And I'll tell you about three distinct threads that led to an understanding. The first of this, you heard a little about this from Bank Westermark, and this was the pioneering work of initially uh, Peter Noel and David Hungerford working in Philadelphia who had identified an abnormal chromosome in the blood and bone marrow of patients with CML that became known as the Philadelphia chromosome. In 1973, Janet Rowley showed that this abnormal chromosome was the result of a chromosome translocation between chromosomes 9 and 22. And during the 1980s, when people began to map genes to chromosome locations, it became clear that the Abelson gene present on a chromosome 9 had been translocated to chromosome 22 and created a fusion gene and protein called BCR Abel. A second thread was the entire history of tumor virology, beginning with the pioneering work of Peyton Rouse, who discovered the Rouse sarcoma virus. As it turned out, the transforming principle of the Rouse sarcoma virus was the V-SARC oncogene. Similarly, there was a second transforming retrovirus that carried the V-ABL oncogene. And then in 1976, Harold Barmus and Michael Bishop showed that these viral oncogenes were actually cellular genes that had been transduced by these retroviruses to cause cancer. It also, of course, that linked to the BCR-ABL oncogene. Lastly, there was the entire thread of protein phosphorylation. Beginning in the 1930s with the identification of serine and threonine phosphorylation, and then the pioneering work of Tony Hunter, a previous Schoberg awardee who discovered tyrosine kinases. As it turned out, the founding member of the tyrosine kinase family was the V-SARC oncogene. V-ABL was the second tyrosine kinase identified, and that led to the possibility that you could begin to think about tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So when I came into this field in the late 1980s, 1990, this is where the field stood. BCR Abel is a therapeutic target, present in every single patient with chronic myeloid leukemia. We knew from the work of David Baltimore, who had put BCR Abel into animal models, that if you put BCR Abel in animals, they develop leukemia. So this was leukemogenic oncogene. One of the first experiments I did in collaboration with Jim Griffin was to show that if you knocked out kinase activity of this oncogene, this gene had absolutely no transforming activity. So for those of you that don't think about kinases as much as I have over the past 30 years, this is what a kinase does. It binds ATP and transfers phosphate onto tyrosine residues of specific substrate proteins. And it's these substrate proteins that cause the uncontrollable proliferation of white blood cells in patients with chronic myeloid leukemia. So it was my view that if you block binding of ATP to this specific kinase, you'd have an ideal therapeutic target. Now, despite the fact that there are hundreds of kinase inhibitors currently, in 1990, the view of the world was that kinases are an, not a viable target and, frankly, potentially undruggable. One of the views was if you're going to block binding to ATP, there will never be specificity because ATP is ATP. And if you bind to ATP, 
In any one kinase, it'll bind to every single kinase. And with there being 550 kinases in the human kinome, the view was there could never be specificity. The second hurdle was that oncologists back in the 1990s were relatively pessimistic. And the view was, how is it possible that a single agent for cancer will ever work? Third problem was, even if you could get around the, the specificity problem, the early knockout animals of tyrosine kinases, PD GF receptor, EGF receptor, were embryonic lethal. So even if you had specificity, the view was these are going to be incredibly toxic because these kinases are so important to the growth and survival of cells. But the real death knell was they're never going to make enough money. So if you think about 200 people in Sweden, 5,000 people in the United States, and if I told you it would cost about 10 billion Swedish crones to develop a compound like this, and the return on your investment with a 1 in 10 chance of success would be 1 billion per year, I doubt I'd have any takers on that project. Now, despite that, in the late 1980s, a group at Sibagaygi, which is now Novartis, began to develop tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And I had established some collaborations with Nick Lydon. And in 1993, when I moved to Oregon, he sent me a handful of compounds. One of the compounds was this one, STI-571, now known as imatinib or Gleevec. Nick's group had actually had an interest in both EGF receptor inhibitors, PDGF receptor inhibitors, and they created this compound initially as a PDGF receptor inhibitor. Turned out it also inhibited ABLE. So when it arrived in my lab, I knew we had a PDGF receptor inhibitor and an ABLE inhibitor. But what I wanted to explore initially was what other kinases did it, did it inhibit. So this is a Tony Hunter kinase dendrogram. And first of all, here's PDGF receptor. I wanted to look at all these other receptor tyrosine kinases. In addition, here's able tyrosine kinases, and I wanted to look at all these other related intracellular tyrosine kinases to see how specific this compound was. And what we showed was this compound was remarkably selective. We added the kit tyrosine kinase to the profile, but everything else was not inhibited. No other members of the receptor tyrosine kinase family, including EGF, insulin, uh, FLT3, and a variety of other receptor tyrosine kinases, and no other cellular tyrosine kinases of the SARC or JAK family. We then went to our in vitro and animal models of beast or able driven leukemia using this able. PDGF and KIT tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And in this 1996 Nature Medicine article, we published that this compound selectively kills B. able expressing cells both in vitro and in vivo, but did not inhibit normal cells and did not inhibit the growth of V. SARC expressing tumors. Fortunately, the company was able to make this into a highly bioavailable formulation. So after several years of trying to convince the company to go to clinical trials, we went to clinical trials with an oral agent. So in 1998, we began a phase one clinical trial. And this was an unusual clinical trial in that the only patients we enrolled on this phase one study, which is typically a safety study, were patients with CML. And there are two reasons why we limited to patients with CML. Number one, having run a number of phase one clinical trials, it was my view it would be unethical to expose patients that had no chance of responding to this drug, to, these, to this agent. But second and most important, we wanted to show early activity to the drug company. So if this drug worked, we wanted a very quick readout in patients likely to respond. So I was able to convince the drug company that this was the right shape for this clinical trial, and it worked exactly as we had hoped. Within six months, we reached therapeutic doses of 300 milligrams and above. And in these patients, we saw significant therapeutic benefits. In our chronic phase patients who have become resistant to standard therapy with interferon, 98%, that was 53 out of 54 patients responded, and virtually all of them were durable. This is our 500 milligram dose cohort. As you can see, the white line at 10 is the upper limit of normal of a white blood count. 
each of the individual colored lines are individual patients' white blood counts. They all entered with elevated white blood counts between 20 to 100,000. All of them had very rapid responses to normal white blood counts that persisted throughout therapy. Now, it's said when you develop an effective drug, you really only need one patient to convince yourself that the drug is effective. And this is my one patient, sort of a before and after picture. Now, the reason I have this patient's blood counts before, and you can see they were kind of sawtooth all over the place, is the patient's wife was an accountant. She likes numbers. She kept track of me. She'd come into clinic when her husband's white blood count was quite high, and she'd say, Dr. Drucker, you're not doing very well at controlling my husband's blood counts, are you? And I respond, ma'am, I'm doing the very best I can, and I'd increase his dose of medication. In April of 1999, we started him on a matinib at 300 milligrams, and by December of that year, she finally said, Dr. Drucker, I think I can stop checking up on you. <laughs> now, of course, regulatory agencies don't allow you to get drugs approved on single, single patients, so we went to very large randomized phase three studies comparing the prior therapy, interferon plus ARC, to imatinib. This study was remarkable in that it included 177 centers in 16 countries. The principal investigator here in Sweden was Bent Simonsen. It enrolled a th over 1,000 patients in a seven-month period. So think about that. 200 patients a year in Sweden, 5,000 in the United States, and we enrolled 1,000 patients in seven months. Half of the patients got randomized to imatinib, and half of the patients got interferon plus air C. And in every single parameter we measured, there were statistically significant better results for a matinib. So on the far left, complete hematologic response, normalization of blood counts, significantly better. A complete absence or disappearance of the Philadelphia chromosome, the complete cytogenetic response. Again, 85% of patients with a matinib achieve that as compared to only 14% with interferon. Intolerance of therapy, patients on interferon hated it, flu-like symptoms, whereas only 3% of patients with imatinib had difficulties with tolerance. The results were so dramatically better for imatinib, all the patients on interferon were crossed over, so we don't have survival comparisons. But when you look at the overall survival, this is five years. Remember, we previously had said if patients were diagnosed with this leukemia, they had a three to five year life expectancy. Now the CML specific survival is 95%. But the most remarkable study, and this is one of my very favorite slides, was performed in Sweden. And this was published in 2016. And because the Swedes have, you have access to all the registry data of all your cancer patients over decades, this group was able to look at the survival of patients diagnosed from the 1970s until present. And what they did was they looked at what is life expectancy if you were 55 and diagnosed with CML, and male or female. If you're diagnosed in the 80s or 90s, you had a three to five year life expectancy as compared to a 20 to 25 year life expectancy of an age match control. Now if you're diagnosed in 2010, survival is pretty close to normal. Now, I have to say that this is not reproducible worldwide, and for two reasons. First of all, access to health care, and second of all, access to medications. But when you have great health care and access to medications, these are the kinds of results you can see. But we also know that imatinib is not perfect. If you look at the risk of disease progression or relapse at six years, between 7 to 17% of patients will have evidence of disease progression or relapse. And much like you heard from Dennis Slayman, we've got to go back to the lab and understand why do these patients relapse? Well, we have an ABL kinase inhibitor. So the first question you would want to ask, is the ABL kinase still inhibited? Because if the kinase is still inhibited and patients relapse, it has to mean additional mutations now driving the growth of the leukemia. If, however, the kinase is no longer inhibited, it must mean that something happened that allows this kinase to be reactivated. 
such as the drug getting pumped out of the cells. Perhaps the target's been amplified, maybe it's been mutated, or maybe the drug has been metabolized. Some of the laboratory studies we did was first of all to develop assays for the inhibition of ABL kinase. In addition, we also wanted to study how does imatinib bind to the ABL kinase to see whether that might mediate resistance. And then, of course, we wanted to search for alternate ABL inhibitors that might circumvent resistance. So in looking for assays for ABL kinase inhibition, we turned to this protein, which my lab has identified as the most heavily tyrosine phosphorylated protein in CML patient samples. This is a protein adapter called CRACL, which is an SH2, SH3 containing protein. We could show that it was a direct substrate of the B-serable tyrosine kinase. And if we put B-serable into CRACL in all animals, B-serable did not function quite as well. But we we're able to develop a bioassay of crackle phosphorylation. And what you can see here is that crackle migrates as a doublet. So here is the unphosphorylated crackle, and here is tyrosine phosphorylated crackle. In patients who are untreated with CML, all of the crackle is phosphorylated. If we put patients on a matnib, you can see a restoration of this unphosphorylated protein. When we looked at patients who had relapsed, most of the patients had crackle phosphorylation, so they had reactivation of the tyrosine kinase. We then began to look at how does imatinib bind to the b serable tyrosine kinase, and we did a variety of models, and then we made mutations of the points of contact. Now, if you can think about Abelson binding to the ATP binding site, you can imagine if you mutate most of those binding sites, they're essential for ATP binding as well, and we saw mostly kinase inactive. But there's this one residue, this threonine 315, that if you made this mutation, it was tenfold resistant. We presented this work at the American Society of Hematology meeting in, in December of 2000, and shortly thereafter, several groups, including Charles Sawyers and others, validated that patients who became resistant had mutations at this and other kinase sites. So now what I'm showing you is the Abelson kinase domain. These are the amino acid residues. And these are mutations and their various frequencies. And you can see that they're scattered around the kinase domain. We then began to understand how that occurred when John Curian's lab began to perform the crystallography studies. And if you focus first on this red activation loop, you can see it has two conformations, a closed conformation and, an open, and another conformation here where it's closed. This is a matnib. And what a matnib does is it binds to the ATP binding site and then has a part of it that covers the activation loop and locks it in the off position. As it turns out, some of the mutations here favor this open conformation. But imagine you had an inhibitor that bound here that didn't care whether the activation loop was open or closed. As it turned out, these tended to be dual SARC able inhibitors. So we now also understood why imatinib didn't inhibit SARC because it had a different three-dimensional conformation. So we then got a dual SARC inhibitor into the lab and showed that here's a matnib and here's the dual SARC inhibitor against some of these mutations, potently inhibiting most of these mutations except 315i. What this work did was it then allowed three different drug companies to develop four new FDA-approved kinase inhibitors that have slightly different spectrum of kinase inhibition but all the common mutations, including T315i, are covered or inhibited by at least one drug. So now we have imatinib as the current standard of therapy, significantly prolonging disease duration. We have relapses mostly due to able kinase domain mutations with four novel able kinase inhibitors that are also now being used in newly diagnosed patients and CML has essentially been converted to a manageable condition. But where else has the matinib worked? 
we know it had three targets, ABLE for CML, and then two others, KIT, which is present in the majority of patients with gastrointestinal stromal tumors, a small percent of melanomas are driven by KIT mutations, and imatinib has worked remarkably there. And then a couple of diseases driven by PDGF receptor, either rearrangements or amplifications. This is hypereosinophilic syndrome or DFSP. But I want to focus for a few minutes on gastrointestinal stromal tumors because there's some incredibly instructive data that came out of these clinical trials. Gastrointestinal stromal tumor is intestinal sarcoma. It has an annual incidence relatively similar to that of CML. And in 1998, a Japanese group published that activating kit mutations were present in the majority of patients with this disease. At the time, very few patients would respond to any form of chemotherapy, including high-dose multi-agent chemotherapy. Based on some preclinical work done both at our institution and at Dana-Farber and others, we convinced Novartis to move to clinical trials in patients with gastrointestinal stromal tumors. And what we saw was, as compared to a 5% response rate, close to 54% of patients had a response, and 28% had stable disease, and they derived significant clinical benefit. Responses in these patients were remarkable and rapid and dramatic. This is a pre-therapy PET scan on the left showing dramatic uptake in these liver metastases. One month later, that liver met is completely cold, and you just see physiologic uptake in the heart, kidneys, and bladder. But the instructive data came from the laboratory studies done by Mike Heinrich at my institution, Jonathan Fletcher at Dana-Farber, which was to sequence every single patient's kit mutation in these clinical trials. And in the clinical trials, if you had a common kit mutation, you had an 80% response rate. In contrast, if you just expressed wild-type kit, but with no mutation, the response rate was only 18%. But they did something even more remarkable. And they said, what is it about these 18% of patients that allowed them to respond? And they reasoned, we have an ABLE, KIT, and PDGF receptor inhibitor. Let's sequence those three kinases and see if that's what mediates response. And what they found was that the patients with wild-type KIT who responded had PDGF receptor mutations. And what that tells you is that careful study of subset of patients can real, reveal important insights. Now, I'll tell you an interesting story. I was giving a talk in around 2002, at a meeting, I had arrived late. I couldn't give my talk, and I was asked to give a dinner talk without any slides. So I was covering this remarkable gastrointestinal stromal tumor data, talking about how careful study of responding patients can reveal important insights in the discovery of these PDGF receptor activating mutations. Sitting next to me at the dinner table was Dan Haber, one of my very good friends and colleagues. And he had become interested in what was driving responses to the EGF receptor inhibitors. And he was intrigued by the fact that thousands of patients worldwide had been treated, but only about 10% were actually responding remarkably and dramatically. And based on this conversation, he went back and immediately started to look at the targets of the EGF receptor inhibitors. And shortly thereafter, he published this paper showing that it was activating mutations in the EGF receptor that mediate a response to the EGF receptor inhibitors. Now, in fairness, there were other groups like at the Broad Institute that were doing whole exome sequencing, and they actually came to the very similar conclusion. But the reality is we significantly accelerated the pace of progress by this type of discovery. But even more remarkably, let's look at what that work has led to. Now it's commonplace to sequence every single patient with lung cancer. And I have to tell you, the most skeptical group about targeted therapy when I started out were lung cancer specialists. But look at lung cancer today. Every single patient with lung cancer gets sequenced, and there are dozens of mutations, and most of them have drugs that are approved or in clinical trials, and lots of them are kinase inhibitors. But what that tells us is where we're headed. 
is where we're headed is we're going to define cancer not by the site of origin, but by the molecular abnormalities. We'll design treatments based on that information, and these treatments are going to work so much better the first time and are going to be much less toxic. But lest you think that future is some distant future, there was recently a drug agnostic kinase inhibitor approved, Lertrectinib, for a relatively rare set of abnormalities. This represents less than 1% of all molecular abnormalities in cancer. A small subset of breast cancers, the secretory breast cancers, a small set with rearrangements in lung cancer, and then relatively common in some very rare tumors. 55 patients were treated with this drug, which led to the FDA approval based on just the fact that they have this rearrangement. So when we think about imatinib and think about this paradigm, yes, we've converted CML to a chronic manageable condition. But remember, when we started on this journey, kinases were not a druggable target. But this has spurred the development of dozens and dozens of FDA-approved kinase inhibitors and hundreds more in clinical trials. And thanks to this work, thanks to the work of Dennis Slayman and many, many others, this has really helped usher in the era of precision medicine. But lest you think I'm all about targeted therapies, for the last 20 years I've given similar talks, I've talked about the fact that we need a very broad-based approach to cancer. Yes, we need far more specific therapies directed at these critical targets. But now there's been a whole explosion of immune therapies. One of the original winners of the Schoberg Prize, Jim Allison, as you heard, for checkpoint inhibitors, has led us to think about how we can modify the immune system to attack cancer. But in addition, we have to think about how do we provide precision prevention and early detection. Because when we think about the work that I've done, we treated a relatively early malignancy. When you heard Dr. Slayman's talk, when you moved these drugs up early in the course of the disease, we've seen even more dramatic survival benefits. So we have to think about targeting cancer earlier and ultimately think about how we provide precision prevention. So in closing, I'd like to acknowledge literally hundreds and hundreds of people who helped me on this project, all of my coworkers at the Knight Cancer Institute, all of the people throughout the world who put patients on our clinical trials, Novartis who funded the clinical trials, and my own funding agencies, the National Cancer Institute, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. But the people I really want to thank are the people who went on this journey with me. People who are now alive and thriving. This is the longest continuous patient on imatinib now 20 years, having passed her 20-year anniversary in January of 1999, doing what she enjoys, which is gardening. The very first patient from Italy treated with imatinib, doing what he does, enjoys most, which is dancing. A remarkable young woman who was diagnosed in 2001 at the age of six is now a nurse at one of our, our children's hospitals in Oregon at the age of 23, and she's actually due to be married this summer. Another remarkable man who was diagnosed over 15 years ago in our very first appointment, he said, I hope to be able to walk my daughter down the aisle someday. And here he was this past summer doing just that. Some absolutely remarkable people. This was the very first patient from Australia treated on the imatinib clinical trials. She was from Australia and was selected to be one of the torchbearers for the Sydney Olympics in the year 2000. These are individuals, and we treat each of our patients one at a time, but pretty soon it starts to add up to whole lots of people alive and thriving. And this is my hope for the future of cancer therapy. We'll talk about one disease at a time. We'll talk about one target at a time. But pretty soon it all starts to add up with lots more people surviving and thriving despite a diagnosis of cancer. And that's my hope for the future. Thank you very much.